All right, there's my intro music. <laughs> there he goes. There's not as much time. People don't walk on stage. So we don't have as much time to play the music. All right. <laughs> All right. Thanks for the great intro, Jared. And yes, having a wombat as a pet is an Australian thing. Not particularly common, but my mum was a big wombat fan and had one at home. <laughs> Anyway, thank you everyone for joining. Uh, the New York R Conference is one of my favorite conferences of the year. I'm very sad I couldn't be there in person this year, but we know all about that. But on the plus side, I do get to present in my pajamas. Um, I'm not standing up, so, so that's awesome. Anyway, the talk today is I'm going to talk to you about um, building machine learning applications with R using an end-to-end -end continuing integration, continuous deployment process uh, built around machine learning operations, or MLOps. Now, this is kind of a um, uh, basically a sequel to a talk that I gave back at the R Studio conference in January. Remember back when we actually gave talks in person with other people around? Um, and in that talk, um, which you can find at the link at the bottom of the screen right there, that's the GitHub repository for that talk. You can find the slides in there and also a link to the R Studio website where you can watch the recording. Um, in that talk, I talked a lot about DevOps. Now, you might have heard about DevOps. It's a process that's been used to facilitate the development of traditional software, you know, games, applications, that kind of thing, for quite a while. Um, a good definition, which comes from my colleague Donovan Brown, is to say that DevOps is the union of people, process, and products to enable continuous delivery of value to your end users. I like that definition because the value there applies not specifically to software or applications, but in general. And in fact, we took that concept a little bit further in the last talk I gave in January to say, can we apply these DevOps processes to machine learning, working with data, delivering models, process we call MLOps, machine learning operations. Uh, too long didn't, didn't read. Um, the answer to that is yes. Uh, the big difference, though, between MLOps and DevOps is data. The fact that we've got to manage lots of data, changing data changes things all the way downstream through our models. We've got to use big systems, you know, lots of powerful hardware to train these models a lot, a lot of the time. Anyway, I talk about that in detail in that other presentation, so check that out if you like. But one of the things that I did in that presentation was develop a Shiny app, and we're going to build on that concept uh, in this talk here. But first of all, let me show you a little demo of this Shiny app. I'm going to put it up on the screen. Here we go. So this is my Shiny application. Um, it's based on some data from the US National Traffic Survey. Um, it's basically calculating a lot of uh, variables associated with, um, with vehicle accidents. For example, the impact speed, uh, whether the driver was wearing a seat belt, things like that, how old the occupant was. And you can see that as I'm changing these various variables, a prediction is being generated about the likelihood of a fatality associated with that incident. You think this might be a model that might be used in assurance assessment, things like that. Um, so what we're going to do is build on this in this particular case and see how we can build a model like this, develop it, deliver it, sorry, to a shiny application, and then orchestrate that whole process with software. So going back to my slides here. All right. In the talk I gave in January, I talked about Azure Machine Learning Services. Azure Machine Learning Service, which is a set of Azure Cloud Services, and a set of Python and R SDKs. And of course, I'll be using the R SDK here uh, for building models, working with data, training models in the cloud, um, finding um, models that work, tracking experiments, so on and so forth. But in this talk, I'm going to add an extra layer um, to the process of delivering applications with Azure Machine Learning Service, and that's to use GitHub Actions. And we're going to use GitHub, of course, to manage the code and collaborate with everybody else in our team. But we're going to use GitHub Actions for the continuous integration side of things. Now, if you're not familiar with GitHub Actions, here's the TLDR. Um, it's really easy to work with. Um, all you do is create YAML files in a special folder within your GitHub repository, and that's to find your jobs. Now, YAML is basically a, a text file, so it's easy to work with. Um, it's really just a series of key value pairs with, a, with several uh, conflicting ways of defining arrays. We won't worry about that too much. It's really easy to work with when you get into it. You just set up these text files, and that defines jobs to do things like copy over data, train a model, 
put a model into the cloud, deploy a Shiny app, all those kinds of things. And we'll see that as we have a look at a demo. Um, as you get into GitHub Actions, you, um, basically, I learned it by cutting and pasting, which is how I learned all, te all technology. Um, but there's a nice marketplace that you can search with. Like I searched in there for how do I you know, run a command on a remote server with SSH. I found a predefined action or a template that I can cut and paste into my code, and I had it working really, really quickly. Once you've got these actions set up in those Yammer files, you basically push your code to GitHub in the same way you do normally, and then the actions automatically trigger according to rules that you define, and then start all of your processes. And we'll see that in action in a minute. Now, the Git Shiny app that I showed you just a minute ago has um, the architecture just here. Um, all of the code, of course, let me just pop up my pointer. All of the code, of course, is sitting over here in GitHub. And I've written an action in GitHub, for example, to control the Azure Machine Learning Service and do things like generate a training cluster, which is what we're going to use to train all of our models. I've also generated some actions in GitHub that are going to SSH over to a virtual machine. Now, that virtual machine is where we're running the Shiny server, of course. But also, because it already has R installed, it's a convenient place for us to run the R scripts that we need. And those R scripts are going to do things like access the um, Azure Machine Learning Service to kick off the training of our models with the R scripts. And once those models are trained, to create an endpoint, an HTTP a URL that we can use to plug into the Shiny server to deliver our models. We're going to see that in action in just a second. Now, by the way, um, I've been using Visual Studio Code as I've been developing this talk and this application. Now, I normally use R Studio when I'm developing R, but in this case, I'd already developed all the underlying models. Uh, it's basically some caret um, calls that do the training against the data set. Um, so in this case, because I'm using lots of different things at once, um, I'm not just using R, I'm also using Bash, I'm using YAML, I'm interacting with the GitHub and so forth. It made it quite for me, convenient for me to use Visual Studio Code. Um, it has good enough R integration. It's not as good as R Studio, but enough that I could just test things out at the command line. Uh, but for things like you know working with the Bash shell, which I did within the Windows uh, subsystem for Linux, has a nice integration there. Um, the other thing that uh, Visual Studio Code is really good at is interacting with GitHub. Um, the fact that I can just modify my files, check them in, push them out to GitHub just with a couple of clicks really, really sped things up for me. And the other feature that was really useful to me, which you can see being used down here in the corner, is what's called remote connections. Um, not only can I connect into my Linux instance on my Windows box as I'm doing my development, I can also remote over to that virtual machine. Uh, which is running Shiny. And it's much easier to actually remote over and say, edit the Shiny configuration file with Visual Studio, correct? Visual Studio Code directly, rather than having to use um, a command line editor like Vim or something um, over in the virtual machine. But you can use any editing, editing environment you like. It's not necessary for this particular case. So let me show you some of the actions that I developed for this application. Uh, one of the applications is talking directly to the Azure Machine Learning Service. And again, this is one of those actions that I found um, on, the, um, on the marketplace. This is a simple action to create a compute cluster within Azure Machine Learning. And that's one of the nice things that Azure Machine Learning does is it manages cl clusters of virtual machines that you can use for training. Um, I set up a cluster of a maximum of four nodes. And sometimes when I was running lots of jobs in sequence, particularly as I was developing the model in the, in the early days, running lots of models at the same time was really useful and saved time for me. Um, this action de depends on a JSON configuration file. And you can see the configurations I've got right here. I really do recommend using the minimum nodes of zero. Uh, what that means is after the training is finished, the cluster automatically shuts down, and you're not charged for any of that compute time. And that really cuts down costs, as we'll see in a minute. Also, another useful tweak you can make is to increase the number of idle seconds before the cluster shuts down. Um, so I've, in this case, I've got five or five or 10 minutes to run a new model before um, the VM shuts down. Then I have to wait for it to start up again. Let's have a look at another action. This is the action that I'm using to train the model. Now, of course, I'm going to use R to train the model. As I mentioned, I'm using the carrot package to fit a logistic regression. To this, so I've got a model called uh, an R script rather called train model.r. And all I did was found a GitHub action that would then 
SSH across to the virtual machine where I'm running R and Shiny, run my training model script. And then as part of my training model script, it's actually connecting into the Azure machine learning service to run that script on the cluster that I just set up. So I've got lots of compute power available to me to run this particular calculation. Another nice thing that you can do with the uh, R interface into the Azure Machine Learning Service is to record metrics. So every time that you run a model, you can calculate it, its accuracy. And then at any time, it's kind of like a reproducibility environment. I can go back into a web interface that Azure Machine Learning provides, have a look at all the runs that I've done in the past. <clears throat> I can get all the scripts that generated those runs, the underlying data, and then any, and have a look at a chart of any metrics that I, that I calculated on those models. In this case, it was the accuracy. Um, and this is really useful when you're in the original developing uh, phase uh, for the model. Let's have a look at another um, GitHub action. This is one to deploy our model as a REST endpoint. So what this means is um, I've got an R script. Um, you can see it here called deploymodel.r, um, which is then going to uh, take the script that generated uh, a script to do the prediction. So to take a saved version of the R model representing my logistic regression, uh, plug in numbers, all those variables associated with the traffic incident, uh, driver age, vehicle speed, all those kinds of things, plug those into that model and then generate a prediction, probability of fatality. And then I'm gonna deploy that model as a web service. So what this means is I'm essentially generating my own API it's an endpoint that lives in the cloud where I can pass all of those input variables as just a JSON text string. The R model runs, generates the prediction, and then returns the result, the prediction, through HTTP. And then I can integrate that into our Shiny application, as we'll see just in a minute. Um, this particular case, I'm running that model on just a single container, an Azure Container Instance. Um, you can see it's pretty small. It's only got one core and half a gig of memory, but that's quite sufficient for this um, small model. Uh, container instances are really useful when, you own, when you're in the developing phase just to try things out. When you want to move into production, if you've got a model that's going to be hammered by sort of a consumer application, for example, you can run these models in a Kubernetes cluster, and that'll give you the scalability support, you know, thousands, millions of uh, interactions with that model uh, simultaneously. So here's the code that's actually doing all of that using the R scripts. And of course, you can manage all the endpoints that you have in the Azure Machine Learning Service through its web interface as well, in addition to through the R code. Lastly, this is the Shiny app that we saw, saw just a minute ago. And the way it is generating the prediction, which is represented as the height of this bar, is simply by calling out to the endpoints that we just published into the cloud. So we're using the HTTR library, to do a post interaction with the endpoint. So this accidental endpoint is just a URL that we provided. The input is coming from the selections that are made in the Shiny app encoded into JSON. And then we extract out the result from the content and then that becomes our prediction. And then we're deploying this Shiny app, just the R script by copying the files over using SSH, again, using a GitHub action. So again, the, the Shiny app is just running the code that does the user interface, generates the R graphic using just this, the simple bar plot function, and then it's calling out to the container to generate the prediction. So one of the nice consequences of this is I can use this same model that generates a probability in a desktop application, say written in C Sharp, uh, a mobile application written in Swift, uh, basically any application that can interact with, interact with the cloud endpoint I can now integrate this R model into really, really easily and also to make it scale. So let's actually have a look at that in action. And one of the things you might have noticed is that on this screenshot, the color of the bar is purple. So let me show you how I would change that. So let me go ahead and pop up Visual Studio Code and the application, which you can see right now is a blue bar. Here I have Visual Studio Code. I'm going to find the Shiny app, app.r right there. And I've got a line of code here, which is running the bar chart, just using a render plot in Shiny. Um, one of the parameters here is color, which is right now set to a blue. So let me go ahead and change that to a purple. Oops. Okay. Right, I'm going to save that file. 
Okay, and you notice my uh, Git interaction has popped up here. So let me check in that change to app.r. Put in a checking code, purple bar, commit that. Now I'm going to sync that up to GitHub. And now the file has changed in my repository. Now let's go to my repository. I'm going to go to the Actions tab. OK, you can see here there's one here, purple bar. That's the check-in I just made. I can drill down here into the individual jobs uh, that have been triggered by this particular change. In this case, it's just one job, and that's the job to deploy the app.r file over into the Shiny server running on the VM. You can see that's already happening. It's copying the files over via SSH. That's done. So now if I go back to my application, refresh it, let's choose some variables so we can see the bar, make the cars go faster, make the application, the app occupants older, and now we can see we've got the purple bar. So just by modifying that file, checking it into GitHub, everything else flowed on from that to generate the new version of the app and deploy it. I could have done the same thing by mod modifying the model. In that case, it would have trained a new model, and then it would have deployed the Shiny app, and then I would have a new calculation that was behind that prediction just by checking into code into GitHub. That's it. So you might have some questions about, you know, if you're going to try this out, um, how much does it cost you? I had a look at um, my own statistics within Azure because um, I've been running this for, for a couple of weeks now to see how much it costs. First of all, um, it didn't charge me anything for GitHub Actions. Uh, GitHub Actions is free uh, for all public GitHub repositories. And it's also free even for, for several private repositories as well. So you can try this out. Um, the underlying um, uh, Actions worker, which is in my case is running Linux, um, they're actually quite powerful. You can do quite a lot with them. You can even install R in them um, and do things with R directly within Actions. Uh, they work pretty well. Um, secondly, the Azure Machine Learning Service, <clears throat> the underlying framework for that is also free. Um, so the web interface called Studio, all that logging of statistics that you saw, all the stuff that's orchestrating, deploying models into the cloud, all that comes free as well. All that you actually get charged for is any compute resources you need. <clears throat> and I was actually quite surprised looking back at my stats that I didn't spend a lot on actually training the models, only about 10 cents a day. And even that was only on the days when I actually retrained models. And that's because I had set the clusters to automatically deallocate down to, down to a minimum size of zero when they're not being used. And because I was only using the clusters for a few minutes every day in practice, very little cost to actually training. Now, if you're training really, really big models with lots of data, that might change. Now, another thing about the training cluster is it doesn't run all the time. However, the scoring endpoint and the Shiny server, they do need to run all the time. So that's a bit more expensive. Um, the scoring endpoint cost me about a little over $1.60 a day. And the Shiny server, which again is running Shiny, and also the R infrastructure I use for um, orchestrating the models, is uh, cost me about five, uh, under $4. So overall, just a little over $5 a day for running this infrastructure. Now, if you want to try this out yourself, um, there's a link here on your screen uh, where you can get an Azure subscription if you don't have one already, which will also give you $200 in free credits to use in the next 30 days. Um, so you can try all this out yourself and use those free credits to see how that goes. All right. So just to wrap up, uh, thanks, everyone, for attending. I um, hope you enjoyed this talk. Um, if you want to recreate everything that you've seen, um, you can visit my GitHub repository that you can see on the screen right here. Um, which uh, has all the code and, importantly, all of the GitHub actions to recreate what you've seen today. In fact, all you'll need to do is to clone my GitHub repository, provide some secrets into that clone of yours, um, set up the virtual machine. That is, unfortunately, is still a little bit of a manual process. I am trying to figure out how to automate that part as well. But once you've got it set up, everything is automatic after that, and you can make any changes to those code and see the same deployments that you've just seen right there. And also, if you've got any questions, I'll be in the Microsoft booth at the Expo tab within Hopin to answer any questions right after this talk and also during the next break. Thanks very much.